So good morning, everybody, uh, and welcome to the session of um, the World Health Summit. Um, you are here um, attending um, Keynote 2, which is Pandemic Preparedness in the Era of COVID-19. At the end of this session, we expect to better learn how to prepare for pandemics and to learn these lessons from Africa and the globe. Africa faces unique challenges related to pandemic preparedness. And we have a distinguished lineup of speakers today uh, to support this objective. My name is Dr. Mohamed Lamorde, and I am your session chair. I work with the Infectious Diseases Institute, where I lead the Global Health Security Program. Our first speaker today is Dr. Jonas Waldemeriam. Dr. Jonas is the WHO country representative. He is a Ethiopian national and he holds a doctorate degree in medicine. Since the start of the pandemic, in fact, prior to the start of the pandemic, while we were in preparedness, Dr. Jonas has been the face of the WHO, contributing its quota to Uganda's preparedness and response. We are glad to have him today, and he would be speaking on the role the WHO played in Uganda's preparedness to prevent, detect, and respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. Dr. Jonas, you're welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Mohammed and uh, uh, colleagues. I hope you can hear me well. Uh, I'll try to, to uh, do a, a short presentation to put the issues in context. Uh, Uganda was fortunate uh, in, in that uh, it's one of the countries which has a very good uh, preparedness experience. And I will put, try to put it in context that how uh, the pandemic uh, came and in what background the, the, the pandemic came and how we responded. Uh, basically, just to put in, in context, uh, the WHO vision and mission in emergencies uh, focuses on two things. Uh, one is protecting health and saving lives. And the other is fulfilling its obligation as uh, a coordinator of international actions for outbreaks or any other emergencies. And we have a specific uh, about five objectives in doing that. Uh, the first one is doing a risk assessment and situation analysis. Uh, this is supported by uh, coordinating other partners. And based on that, we also deploy uh, to ensure that there is a sufficient uh, expertise and material resources to uh, respond. And one of the tools we have seen to be very useful is the incident management system. And this helps to coordinate uh, response as well as to uh, allocate resources. And such incident management system has to be laid by uh, government uh, and where all partners uh, could contribute. And also, uh, we, we get involved in supporting the government to develop a, a response strategy and plans and appeals. And there, our emphasis is to make sure that uh, those response strategies and plans are based on evidence. And of course, uh, our bread and butter is the surveillance and early warning systems and to make sure that this systems are in place. So to put that, the, the, to put this into context, I, I, I think Uganda is, is very unique and, and it presents a number of challenges. Also with every challenge comes uh, an opportunity. Uh, as you know, it's geographical location into the biodiverse uh, rich Congo basin the, the flavoviruses and African meningitis and year of fever belts makes it the country see a number of uh, outbreaks. Uh, and uh, we continuously see different outbreaks from cholera 
to plague from meningitis to malaria to from Crimean Congo uh, and Ebola to mention some of the hemorrhagic fevers. And uh, Uganda had a number of uh, Ebola outbreaks. And uh, here I tried to show on the map some of the uh, outbreaks of um, Ebola and other uh, outbreaks. But in 2019, on 11th of June, although we were prepared, uh, we were prepared when we first uh, heard the Eastern uh, DRC Ebola outbreak, we started preparing and we had put uh, surveillance and uh, early warning systems. And it wasn't much of a surprise for us when on the 11th of June, we, we, we discovered the first uh, Ebola case. And as per uh, the international health regulations, uh, Uganda declared it, has, um, it is going through uh, an Ebola outbreak. And uh, I, I'll try to share the, this transparency. Uh, and in the uh, Ebola response, our focus was on coordination, surveillance, uh, case management, and vaccination. Uh, I'll just put this for, for a few uh, seconds because I, I don't intend to go through all of it, but I think that was probably one of the, the good uh, happenings which, which happened before this pandemic, that we were in the middle of responding and responding very well uh, in a coordinated manner by putting the coordinating mechanism, a surveillance mechanism, a case management mechanism. And for the first time, we also deployed vaccination as a preventive method uh, even before we had the Ebola, we started vaccinating health workers and protecting them from uh, the Ebola outbreak. And this, while we were almost uh, finishing with this uh, outbreak, then came uh, the, the pandemic. Uh, so part of what we learned uh, in the Ebola outbreak is that there is a very important to ensure there is a rapid uh, laboratory testing and the result being shared and that we found to be critical and, and that helped us also in the, in the pandemic and that we have to look into uh, a rapid diagnostic help uh, also beyond uh, diagnosing the cases and it's also a tool of prevention and a tool to, to prevent uh, the spread. And as I said, uh, vaccine as a part of the outbreak response was very good. Uh, we also, uh, although we, we didn't go into the full uh, extent of therapeutics for uh, therapeutic trial for Ebola, that experience was also teach, taught us how to do ethical and scientifically sound researches in the time of uh, an outbreak. And that was another lesson uh, which helped us in, in the pandemic. So when we come to the current pandemic and specifically responding to the topic I was given, uh, we one of the, the biggest pillars we have is coordination. So uh, one thing we did is we, when the pandemic started being a, a global issue, uh, we built the uh, coordination mechanism on the already existing uh, coordination system. So we, we just have to set it up based on the previous uh, uh, incident management system. Uh, we also deployed the COVID preparedness and response plan. So it took us relatively a short time to come up with identifying how Uganda would respond for this uh, pandemic and deploying the necessary resources and, and mechanisms. So uh, based on the coordination system, we were able to identify which pillars of intervention has to be deployed and how those uh, should be coordinated. Uh, we deployed technical officers initially centrally, but uh, uh, we reached, uh, actually this slide is also um, and needs a correction. Now, currently, we have uh, nine hubs uh, covering over uh, 80 of the districts. And what we have realized is 
the closer you put the coordination and the technical uh, auspicers supporting the districts and supporting the district task forces, the, the more effective uh, response you will have. The other thing was in coordination is to ensure that the global guidelines are translated, adapted, and be integrated into the standard operation procedures, checklists, and, and so forth that are needed to respond for, uh, for um, the pandemic. Uh, and halfway after the first uh, wave, we also did uh, what we call uh, interaction. Uh, we did a, an interaction review and the simulation exercise, and that was uh, and deployment of rapid response teams. And that helped us to identify what are the new things we have to look if a resurgence uh, happens, because elsewhere there was second wave. So we use this interaction reviews and our experience with simulation expert exercise in national uh, RRTs to shape the resurgence plan, which we are currently using. We also uh, used the Ebola experience to ensure that the UN is also coordinated, that we, we see the collective, uh, the collective uh, uh, resources and uh, technical capacities of the UN without creating duplication and uh, competition. The second area we focused was in surveillance and laboratory. As I told you, laboratory, we found it to be very, very important uh, in responding. The sooner you are able to um, detect, the better you can respond. And building uh, and ensuring that the laboratory and surveillance system hap happens was important in the first wave, and it continues to be an important part in the second wave. And for that, we invested on capac capacity building, as well as supervision and monitoring of uh, point of interest, as well as looking into the risk groups and putting systems to ensure that we, we have the response capacity. Uh, another one which is difficult, which was easier in the first ways, but is more challenging now, is active case searches and uh, verifications of alerts. Uh, that's why now we are seeing more and more uh, active case searches related with contact tracing and so forth. And verification of alerts enables us to uh, detect people with symptoms or with, with uh, rumors of outbreak. And that was part of the source of detecting the, the positive cases and deploying the response uh, uh, capacity. And one thing important in, in all emergencies, which we have realized and, and is helpful, is to make sure that the situ information is shared. because. More than any other time, uh, the um, fake news and infode uh, infodemics has uh, created uh, havoc. So to fight that, you have to make sure that you generate situation reports daily and you do a weekly analysis, a monthly analysis to understand uh, the trends. And that is the one, one of the areas we have focused in. In case management, uh, we looked into guidelines development, um, ensuring isolation and the critical care units are equipped and set up, but also as part of the case management, building infection prevention and controls and refresher trainings of all health workers involved important. Uh, and what we have observed is uh, like Ebola, uh, the health workers are uh, the, the the highest at risk. And the, one of the ways to minimize that is to build their capacity in infection prevention and control. And for them to differentiate between uh, the various uh, outbreaks and make sure that they protect themselves uh, was important. Uh, but it also, uh, we, uh, we hoped that this infection prevention and control uh, efforts and capacities would also enable the, those health workers to disseminate it in their communities and the community can be protected from the infection prevention and control. And the other thing we have observed is most of the healthcare worker infections actually are not necessarily happening in the healthcare uh, facilities, 
but uh, mostly in, in, in their communities. That's why we, we haven't seen uh, deaths and uh, infections higher in uh, high infection areas because proportionally we have less uh, intensive care unit uh, doctors and nurses and other health workers as well as less laboratory people are infected compared to other health workers which have been infected in the community. The other tool which has come late, but has come in this COVID uh, era, but relatively faster compared to the other uh, interventions we have was uh, vaccine. So our effort from the very start was to ensure that we support the vaccine deployment plans are developed. And later on, the micro plans are developed, ensure that the cold chain uh, capacity is assessed so that we can target uh, the quantification and orders because uh, you know Uganda has a capacity to uh, for uh, ultra cold um, uh, fridges, but uh, more than that, it has the normal uh, cold chain. So uh, our request for which kind of vaccine is is also influenced by knowing the our cold chain capacity. So now we know that. How much, um, for example, Pfizer we could import, what is our limit versus uh, AstraZeneca or other vaccines uh, to be uh, available. And also we, we helped in training and uh, uh, of uh, especially in uh, procurement of uh, immunization related essential supplies, as well as provision of PPEs and equipments for vaccination. Uh, we, we, we may forget it, but one of the major, uh, major uh, bottleneck, uh, unless you manage it, is logistics and supplies. So because of the global shortage, we have to really look into uh, how to best use our procurement and distribution systems. We had been directly building capacity of the logistics teams, assessing local and international capacities, as long as also we have kept uh, sufficient uh, strategic stocks. Uh, even when the government has, for example, PPE, we keep aside a certain uh, proportion uh, to ensure that very critical uh, areas are fulfilled. The same goes for tests and so forth, so that uh, we, we would be able to fill those gaps uh, if needed. Uh, we also build partnerships at national and international levels, and we, uh, we appreciate our funders who were very, uh, uh, very positive for our response and the government's response. And in building the partnerships, one of the most important thing is uh, accountability and transparency. Uh, we took the advantage of being uh, having a very good collaboration with the government to ensure that we uh, bring partners and uh, discussions with the government, with the UN, uh, but also the COVAX facility, which is co-led by WHO, Gavi, and SEPI, and where UNICEF is a collaborator and uh, uh, responsible for logistics. This is one of the, the most innovative things which uh, we hope will help us in um, tackling this um, uh, pandemic. Uh, I think I'll stop there and, and uh, if there are questions, uh, address them. Uh, thank you very much. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jonas. Um, I will ask um, our audience uh, to please type into the Q&A box um, if you have any questions. Uh, we're going to move from speaker to speaker, and at the end, um, we would have an opportunity to have clarifications uh, for a very few minutes um, at the end of this uh, session. We're now moving on to the second talk of this keynote. Um, I will be presenting on uh, pandemic preparedness in Africa and lessons learned uh, from COVID-19. 
For those of you that have attended the morning session, you would see that um, Dr. Nkenga Song actually presented on um, this third wave in Africa. Um, the concern with the third wave obviously is that it's far more severe than the prior waves that we've seen. And why are we worried? Uh, we're worried because when it comes to critical care, our outcomes are, are worse. Um, this is a study that was done in 10 African countries, um, drawing on data from 64 hospitals that admitted severe and critical cases. And the mortality was high. Patients that had critical disease, 48.2% of them died uh, within 30 days um, of, of of being in hospital or discharge. And what is the real issue here? Why do we have um, this higher than expected mortality rate? It has to do with the capacity for intensive care and high, dependent, uh, high, high dependency units. And this is essentially oxygen and a bed at a minimum. Um, and in many countries we have struggled to um, ramp up, I wouldn't say produce, but really ramp up uh, to meet surging demand. And what lesson do we learn from this? The lesson is that while we might have a few COVID treatment units that are recognized and accredited to, to provide care, we should continue building capacity for scale, have other organizations start training, ensure that we have supply chains for oxygen such that we can scale up these beds quickly um, and ensure that we can provide at least um, care for the severe as we really work on um, critical care aspects. There's clearly a lot of despondency and sadness today. Um, in many parts of Africa, Zambia, Uganda, we're seeing this resurgence and stretch of, um, stretching of the national capacity to respond. A long time ago, about 2017, there was a conference in, in Kampala, and this was the Global Health Security Agenda High-Level Ministerial Meeting. It was the first time this meeting was being held in Africa, and the Ministry of Health uh, was um, hosting this meeting along with other parts of the government of Uganda. The GHSA is really a strategy. It's a group of countries, as well as some non-governmental organizations, that come together to accelerate progress to enable us prepare for, for, for diseases, disease outbreaks and pandemics. Despite the efforts um, from the GHSA, um, by 2019, worldwide, many countries had a low level of preparedness for pandemics. The global score was about 40%, and African countries had even lower scores than that. Some have said that this um, index is not really representative of true health security capacity, as even developed countries struggled with the COVID-19 um, outbreak. But what was the key theme? The theme was that health security, while being the responsibility of government, should not be left to government alone. And we must engage communities, non-governmental organizations, and even the private sector. And so one of the things we know is that pandemics are foreseeable disasters. There've been a lot of talk about this was unprecedented, we never thought it could happen. But the reality is that we live in an interconnected world and zoonotic spillover, that is diseases that affect animals that can spread to humans, seems to be happening more frequently. And it's happening more frequently because we have a growing uh, human population. And there is also poverty, which means people have to move out in search of livelihood. This causes encroachment, for example, into wildlife habitats. And in Uganda, for example, we're just at the edge of the Congo Basin, where there's perhaps one of the world's richest biospheres, which means there are many different organisms, plants, animal species, and there are many opportunities for germs to move from animals to humans. To buttress the point that we could foresee this disaster, the WHO has a priority disease research and development blueprint. And this blueprint is really an advocacy tool to get the pharmaceutical industry to start developing products 
against some of the diseases that we know and to put plans in place for diseases we don't know. Amongst the priority diseases that uh, were mentioned in the R&D blueprint, including Ebola and Marburg, and in 2019 to 2020, on the backdrop of the Ebola outbreak in DRC, um, we did get um, new products authorized uh, for managing Ebola, a monoclonal antibody. But they also listed other diseases, arena viruses, chikungunya, as potential diseases that could cause pandemics. But one that should really draw our attention is a highly pathogenic coronaviral disease that is not MERS or SARS. And so really there was an understanding that coronaviruses could cause pandemics even prior to 2020. African countries have to be ready for two syndromes, the viral hemorrhagic fever syndromes, as Dr. Jonas just highlighted, but also the pandemic acute respiratory infections. These two types of outbreaks are very different, mainly because of the way they are transmitted, but also because of the way they affect the health system. Preparedness plans are needed for each of these um, syndromes. So we know that swift action in 2020 saved lives in African countries. It's just that how it was done uh, might be subject to some debate. There was swift political action, strong incident management teams in Africa. We had public health and social distancing measures, full lockdowns in many countries, as well as border, clo border closures. And yet we know that border closures are not recommended um, in international health regulations. What did this do for us? It bought us precious time, brought us time to mobilize resources, build capacity where capacity was needed for, for our health system, and even time for evidence to come out from other countries on therapies that would be available in Africa and, and low cost, such as dexamethasone. Dexamethasone was shown to have about 30% survival benefit um, around the time that first few deaths in Africa started to increase. And so buying time enabled us to get treatments that would improve outcomes for our, some of our severe cases. But the cons are what we've known, economic disruption, essential heavy services disruption, also disruption of supply chains. And many countries had to adjust their border closure measures as well as their social distancing measures over time, relaxing them. And if you say, what is the lesson we learned from preparedness is that if we have stronger border health systems, such as public health emergency response plans for our points of entry, then we can adapt these to the type of outbreak that we're having without, ne without necessarily completely shutting down um, travel and trade. The other thing that we've seen is that institutions can be prepositioned um, to support preparedness and response. I believe one of the reasons why the organizers had the Africa CDC presenting today is because we've seen so much um, of the work that has been done through that agency. And many people may not realize that this was an agency that was set up just in 2016. And in a short time, because of its clear focus on prevention of um, disease uh, outbreaks and supporting national systems, we've been able to see value added to the response in individual countries. And so we have to start thinking of outbreaks, not in the old model where we think of an individual responder going out to join the response, but entire institutions going out to respond to outbreaks. Now, some institutions are made for purpose like Africa CDC and other institutions need to adapt. And my institution needed to change. It was set up to support HIV treatment during the height of the HIV crisis. But along the way with the crisis of Ebola in West Africa, we had to go through a strategic change. And we were fortunate to have resources through CDC to spend about five years building staff capacity. And we were quite lucky that at the time, you know, that project was ending while we had all that human capacity, COVID-19 came in and we were able to leverage some of that capacity to provide support. And the way it's done is that 
organizations, particularly these local organizations for which we do, not, we do know they are not really primarily mandated for response, we have to work within the ambit of the Ministry of Health. We embed within the ministry and then support different areas based on the skill sets the individuals we've employed have. Protect healthcare workers and they will protect you. Infection prevention and control is very challenging when you don't know what disease you're dealing with. And at the start of the outbreak, there was this effort to try to understand what the pathogen was, how it's transmitted and what the appropriate infection prevention and control measure would be. As Dr. Jonas said, you need small teams that look at WHO guidance and help to adapt to the local context and ensure that the countries adopt quickly. And it's not just guidance for triage. We also talk about guidance for things, for example, as making alcohol-based hand rub. The WHO about eight years ago provided guidance to countries that enabled hospitals to produce alcohol-based hand rub on their own. And this is important because alcohol-based hand rub is seen to increase hand hygiene compliance, which is the one thing that you really need healthcare workers to do um, to protect health, um, themselves from infections. Um, it is the number one priority intervention. Now, strengthening personal protective equipment supply for all healthcare workers is a crucial theme, and you'll hear this every time you talk about COVID-19. This is because PPE is expensive and is often in short supply. But we also want healthcare workers to realize the value of sunlight, ventilation, time, space. These four measures are free and they enable us to prevent infections um, even when uh, PPE might be running in short supply. And that requires training or mentorship. Now mentorship for infection prevention and control means that you want to get to as many healthcare workers as possible. What we did in Uganda serves as a model for other countries. In one of the districts where we had previously had Ebola, we were able to reach all the health facilities in that district, 117 facilities. And we did this by working with government mentors, assigning each mentor to three to four different facilities. And then they would go weekly in the first month, then monthly thereafter, to provide support to healthcare workers to make sure triage was functional ensure PPE is being used correctly. As this model was developed, when COVID-19 started, the government of Uganda adopted this as a strategy for capacity building. But I think what was really unique about it is that the government would provide the personnel and HIV organization would provide resources to enable the personnel continue moving. Many interventions in outbreaks are one-off. But in this case, this is an ongoing intervention, which means you can adapt what mentorship you're providing based on the surge in cases that you're having um, for COVID-19. We've seen improvements in several facilities. These are several regions that were supported by IDI, but also improvements have been seen in other regions. Important to note is that some of the funders resolved to save, one of the funders resolved to save lives decided to take this example and use it to scale uh, in nine other African countries, um, such that those countries now have monthly mentorship programs as well. I talked about the alcohol-based hand rub. As time goes on, you find out that you spend more and more and more on PPE and countries can start to run out of resources. But local production can bring down the cost of alcohol by about 40 to 60%. And what we've been able to do in Uganda is spread this district model where a district produces and then distributes alcohol to all the facilities within the district to six different districts now. And this is one of the lessons that we can learn is that we can quickly and rapidly develop local capacity for government to produce its own alcohol um, locally at a cheaper rate and distribute to its own facilities during outbreak. And through CDC, we've been able to spread these experiences even beyond Africa um, to Central American countries. We know we don't have the capacity for research and development for drugs and vaccines, at least not the accelerated development process. And this puts us in a challenging um, situation as countries in Africa. 
Currently, we have some capacity to do evaluation of drugs as they come close to, li to, to licensure in the later stage trials. And there have been some investments such as the one seen here in Jmedic uh, for, for, for Ebola disease in Uganda. But these examples are too few and too far between and greater investment is needed to change this. We need more vaccine. The COVAX facility holds a lot of promise but those that have read the Lancet uh, of last week will see that you know, there's a very negative spin and you know, negative words such as you know, falling short, the beautiful idea falling short have been used. And in other cases, you know, people have flat out said that this, this facility is failing. It has provided some benefit and personally, I believe it will provide more as time goes on we may have to depend on additional vaccine donations. But I think, you know, look, African countries, we need to behave differently. It's not enough to say Western countries are selfish and they've hoarded vaccines, and then individual African countries get vaccine donations through bilateral arrangements and don't, for example, offset a share from the Avcovax so that countries that don't have those bilateral agreements can also benefit. The world operates systems and we must recognize that. And even if we have pandemics, we have to do the hard work to change those systems. Many African countries are signatories to, to the World Trade Organization, some are not. The TRIPS agreement means that the intellectual property rights of, of, of companies needs to be respected. And we have to get an exemption from that. This will enable countries like India and South Africa to produce more vaccines. And there's a strong reason to advocate for an exemption. Many of the pharmaceutical companies in rich countries actually benefited from public or state funding. And so it's strange for them to come back now and say they need to recoup private investments that they've made to develop those vaccines. They've made enough money. These restrictions should go. But when we do get those vaccines, we have to ensure we do things responsibly. One of the first people I saw on social media taking a, a, a vaccine is Dr. Jonas um, in Uganda. He asked, uh, nearly a few days after its arrival, he took his vaccine and he jumped on, the, you know, on, 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 on Twitter, posting the photograph for people to see. Vaccine hesitancy is a complex issue. And it's strange that it might even target the, the, the sectors that are most prioritized, like healthcare workers. Healthcare workers are more likely to worry about rare side effects. They are more likely you know, to think about some of the vaccine um, uh, specific issues that, that might cause hesitancy. And unfortunately, the health workers have been targeted with a lot of misinformation um, through social media and many other places. And so we have to, at all levels, demonstrate leadership and speak positively about vaccines. Vaccines work, vaccines save lives. We have to be consistent in that messaging. In one of the districts, Kotido district, we had a staff member who went from facility to facility, just like you can see in this photograph, talking to healthcare workers about vaccination. And we see that when you talk to healthcare workers, uptake can be very high. We should target them specifically, not just through general messaging, because the questions they have are different. I would like to acknowledge all those that have supported um, me in this presentation and um, those that have provided support uh, to various projects and to the IDI. Thank you. We will now welcome our next speaker, Marius Puri. Marius Puri is the Managing Director of Draga, um, the Sub-Saharan African region. And this is a leading uh, medical technology provider with a presence in over 190 countries and territories. We're going to listen to him um, as he talks to us of pandemic preparedness in the era of COVID-19. Marius, it's a pleasure and welcome. Thank you, Chair. It's really nice to be here and thank you for the invitation. So let me just see how I can share my screen.
Maybe Muhammad, if you can just exit, then I can try. All right, just one. Just try again. Okay, I'll try. You're all set. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. And um, so what I would like to do today is just uh, share with, with, with uh, the attendees or, and also with the other panelists what, how we've looked at Draga uh, to the pandemic, what happened, and um, how we can do things different in um, supporting the African countries, our different sales partner, channel partners all over especially sub-Saharan Africa region. Um, and it's, it's important is, is for us as a company, a technology company, is how can medtech companies contribute to the fight against the virus alongside African countries. Although we are talking about COVID now, I think uh, if we look on in history, we will realize that it's not only this a COVID scenario that we're handling now, but also in future. So pandemic preparedness in general, uh, what we've seen in our research was that the pandemic was not the first pandemic and it will obviously also not be the last pandemic. Uh, what we've done as a company, um, we've made a little bit of a research and I think as uh, the panelists previously said in, in, in the earlier presentations, it's clear to us that pandemics is happening way faster now than previously and we should be aware of it and also the the threat that holds to our people and to our organizations worldwide if we look at um, what can be done from our side um, and hand in hand with our partners we we see first of all i think most of of you know about uh, these initial guidance from the CDC, the World Health Organization, and all the local organizations in how we can try and protect ourselves. And that is uh, the first step towards it. If we looked at what, um, additionally, what is recommended and by who, we had, a look at, we had a look at the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. Uh, we had a look at the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention, and then obviously the World Health Organization. And these three organizations um, is giving a quite good guidance on, on, on how to prepare on the different levels for a pandemic and also what to do next. And I think it is it is very import important that we realized that we need to plan properly because probably in future the worst is still to come if we don't do it um, the right way. First of all, we believe knowledge of products and solutions is extremely important for all role players. For example, if you look at um, what the, the US Center of Disease Control and Prevention they recommended a fabric mask for general public, but it also recommended the N95 mask for, um, for healthcare workers. And if you look at this moment, what is in, available in the, on the market, um, it's from a FFP1, FFP2, EN149 standard, then you've got all the NIO standards, and then also the products that we're receiving uh, from, the, from the Chinese authorities. And it's very important that we understand uh, where you need to use this product to get the maximum protection and support for your health workers. And, and that is very important is that we as, as the role players um, and partners in this value chain, that we understand what's been offered and where this can provide us the correct and the most um, appropriate uh, protection. For us, um, taking all these three, um, this three guidelines in, in, in consideration, for us, the main 
elements needed for any pandemic preparedness is the build-up of critical stock on medical and PP supplies, PPE supplies. Then we need to have a, a continuous repl replenishment of the critical stock. We need to have a secure and reliable logistical supply, especially during a pandemic. And then um, on top of it, we also need to build capacity. Uh, clinical knowledge, what I mean by building capacity is clinical knowledge, technical knowledge, and obviously also we need to look at our facilities, how, it, how we support these. Uh, we also, as a meta company, we had a look at, at, at all these four main um, guidelines uh, to, re, to redesign our thinking on the way forward. Um, it is, it's important that we, that we act early and that we start planning now to, uh, for future, for future uh, reference. If we look at um, what happened, how, can, how different countries and regions handled um, the pandemic, then this is just a graphic of, of which areas and, 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 and sales areas and countries has, has put a kind of a, an export ban on products leaving, leaving their shores. We had a look at this and we then also decided if it happens again, we need to have a different structure and leave a new structure in place. Um, important that we had to think out of the box here and realize that it can happen again. So therefore we have to understand also that the demand on raw materials, the logistic lines uh, coming into Africa during the pandemic over the past year was so difficult. Um, Flying, getting raw materials in from all over the world with restrictions on, on, on closing of borders, uh, flight delays, um, that all played a part in, in our decision how we look in, in the southern, southern Africa, sub Sahara African area uh, for us as a, as a technology company going forward. So what it... So what can medtech companies offer during a pandemic? So what did Draga do? We decided that we're going to move away from the old traditional, um, let's say, country support base to more regional support. And then for that, we can share um, our expertise on a regional way meaning that if we've got a lockdown of borders, then we probably, hopefully, we will be easier to move and provide easier and faster support to that specific region. And also taking the local conditions in consideration, we decided that we will rather go in future for a regional hub to support the customers and their patients in Africa. And this we will do, normally do via our local market partners in the specific countries. And the aim is then to bring the necessary report uh, closer to you as the end customer and the user. With the regional support centers, we aim to bring the support closer to the countries. And what we mean by that is that provide technical expertise, uh, train the local technicians, biomedical engineers in that areas uh, to move faster and quicker to the different countries. Uh, we also uh, is investing in invest, investing in application expertise to provide care faster to to to, to grassroots level, and by having this um, regional support, we probably can guarantee a way better supply chain for this critical supplies to a region and then at the end also a country. By setting this up we will have approximately 150 African colleagues to support um, our sales channel partners, our partners in, in, in the different market segments uh, where you've got previously only a few in a country. And for that, we believe that even uh, when it's difficult with people getting sick, we will have a better uh, support to those countries. What we've done in, through our solution center in, in South Africa, we came up with ideas how to convert a, a hall or a church hall or any, um, let's say, facility 
quickly into handling normal patients for crisis situations, um, to set it up quickly for them in a space spanning matter, um, and putting little components together and uh, uh, provide that to uh, the customers. We also um, then created a solution for more, more higher level care with um, two-bit emergency situations where we can put a ventilator uh, and a, a ventilator monitor and more of these uh, devices components onto a solution which can be moved between beds also to make it more agile uh, supporting the customer and the patient. What we've also done, uh, as we've seen with this uh, export bands, we decided to upgrade the existing FFP production facility in South Africa to a regional production facility. And the idea is that uh, when we're adding, when we expand this, uh, this is for the African demand and hopefully produced in Africa for Africa, raw materials will come into one place and then the, the finished product will be moved in a, in, a, in a much more effective way than bringing it from all over the world into the different countries. One of our other initiatives was a building a central gas supply, which we then fitted into a container and to provide, um, obviously, with the components and with the demand of it, it takes a little bit of time to get all the little components together. But normally we then take uh, what we can get locally, what we then can combine from, from, from Europe or import it, and then we can uh, fast do a turnaround to provide this kind of solution to uh, hospitals and to uh, clinics when needed. Example two is um, we've designed also in a container setup scalable workshops solutions and you can also use it for instance for decontamination units especially for uh, first responders ems or where you don't want to mix your normal uh, hospital equipment with a potential infection um, you can separate it by this wash it uh, very effective for for firefighters uh, as i said fire uh, first responders um, to help you clean and make sure you don't contaminate your other equipment in a meeting. So it's a very practice orientated. We plan it around what the customer need um, will be at that moment or where it's been used. Is it been used again for the military? Is it for the police? Is it for a hospital? We can, uh, we can redesign it. And we've done a few of those for, for customers into, um, into the sub-Saharan Africa region. And that is in short um, what we've done, how we looked at, 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 at preparing, uh, analyze it um, to, go, to go forward. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marius. That's, that was just a stunning presentation. Um, and I think that what I will leave uh, your talk with is the concept of the mobile ventilator. I think that's that's quite a new innovation, but really needed, um, especially where we struggle with space. Um, we're going to move on to our final talk. Um, our final talk is going to be provided by Dr. Bernd Onesorg. Um, Bernd is a, the president, um, Europe, Middle East and Africa of Siemens Health and Years. Um, and he will be talking to us also about pandemic preparedness in the era of COVID-19. Um, looking at it really from a, a global perspective. Um, ben, over to you. Thank you, Mohammed. I hope uh, I can be heard very well. So, and uh, thank you for the very kind invitation. I'm privileged to speak to you actually from Germany to come virtually to, to this panel. Um, and uh, I will uh, address in, in the next couple of minutes a bit the experience uh, from the perspective of uh, a medical industry uh, a company with a broader look at Europe, Middle East, Africa, and even beyond that. Uh, so I will not share a slide, but just uh, uh, give you a few thoughts of both. Uh, what are we experiencing as we speak? What uh, medtech industry uh, can contribute? We heard impressive examples uh, from Drago already, but I will expand on this a little bit. It will especially uh, indicate a bit what 
is it that we should as a uh, as a planet and as a global population and and, and global healthcare systems uh, should learn from this and also what else is there to be looked after beyond uh, pandemic preparedness in order to build a planet uh, with uh, better healthcare provision so um, I mean, I'm, I'm speaking to you out of uh, somewhere in the center of Germany, in the middle of Europe, uh, and can only also share the uh, experience that, I mean, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has brought global healthcare systems, even very mature and, and developed healthcare system, to the edge of its capacities and capabilities. And we saw it all around us, even in the third wave the quite well-developed healthcare system of Germany came to the edge of its capacity, maybe even beyond that in, in a couple of hotspots. And uh, we also heard from other countries in Europe uh, how serious this was to be taken. Now we're in the phase, hopefully, uh, that the fourth wave, wave uh, can be avoided uh, and uh, vaccination uh, can ramp up quickly. What remains from this nevertheless um, and we experience this all around us is a, a common understanding how important a well-established and functional and resilient healthcare systems are i mean it in a way goes without saying in this audience but uh, i mean if you listened uh, in the last couple of years to uh, to the broader political scheme that was not always so high on the agenda as it is right now so there is something if not much but this is a positive outcome of this that uh, the, an understanding of investments in, in functioning well-functioning healthcare systems worldwide is super important the second thing that i believe the world uh, we believe the world has clearly recognized is that global that health challenges are global with the interconnectivity of us here as a planet even with the virtual connections but especially with all the interconnectivity, global travels, global supply chains, uh, a pandemic very quickly goes global. And that is probably a phenomenon that was not so much there a couple of decades to, ago, but something uh, the world has to deal with definitely today. And a third thing I would mention is that there has been now a growing understanding how important collaboration is, not just especially between global healthcare systems and global health organizations, but also between different stakeholders. That the political environment, um, uh, healthcare environment, at the same time, um, industry and science have to work very, very closely together in order to jointly react to such global challenges. It was seen that in, when, when COVID-19 started to spread uh, outside China, that very quick reaction time was super important. And that is already going into what does it mean in preparedness that, I mean, while we are privileged that the development of vaccines have been faster than any time in the past, it is still uh, the treatment options and, uh, or, and curative treatment options as well as vaccines can be developed in such pandemic uh, does take time. So it's a key question how best to bridge the time in an end-to-end -end strategy on from prevention through the right hygiene measures, through then the right test strategies uh, with lab tests, with imaging tests, um, and then uh, the best possible treatment options and capacities for uh, mid-level treatment as well as of, of intensive care. And it was an experience that in order to ensure this, it took quite a bit of time uh, because the co full integrated collaboration of comparing data worldwide of what is the experience with this new type of disease um, has taken some time in order to bring all the knowledge together. It still happened relatively quickly, uh, but in hindsight, one wants to be much more prepared for any future incident of this type that political uh, levels as well as health organizations and industry and science have to work very strongly hand in hand in order to be very quickly reacting, exchanging data in order to very well and quickly uh, develop both the buying time phase from uh, hygiene measures and testing and diagnosing and treating until uh, basically vaccines as well as uh, curative treatment options can be available. So 
this is something which definitely uh, should leave us as a call for action for the future. Now, uh, a few comments of the Siemens health engineers, uh, who we are and what have we experienced. Um, so uh, Siemens health engineers is a subsidiary of, of Siemens. I mean, we are uh, on, on our own feet and own company uh, listed at the Frankfurt Stock Exchange. We have been contributing to the pandemic, not by means of vaccines, we don't do pharma, but we do the whole range of medtech. So that's why to react quickly and develop tests through our uh, laboratory um, uh, technologies, very quickly develop data-driven tests also for imaging. Uh, CT, X-ray was very much deployed uh, with very quick development of algorithms to identify COVID-19 related uh, lung disease uh, and differentiate it from conventional and others as well as then supporting ICUs uh, with the respective medtech uh, of blood tests um, and uh, blood gas tests. So we have been in a way engaged in this entire chain to help bridge the time, as I said before, uh, until uh, curative treatment options and vaccines uh, are available by the pharmaceutical industry. In this it was very important uh, and it was mentioned uh, by the colleague from Draga that global supply chains can be fully kept up to speed. This was a very heavy lesson learned uh, together with the reaction of such a situation, A, to very quickly and as quickly as possible understand this disease, to have early testing and diagnosis options, but at the same time to make sure that global healthcare systems remain intact by ensuring a global supply chain. Um, there, there is some specific areas where local capacity build up, like with FFP2 masks and a few other things, are, re are options. I can say in MedTech, uh, uh, a multitude of local uh, capacity buildups are not necessarily uh, giving the support that one could imagine. There, it is really about ensuring the global interconnectivity of supply chain from raw materials, from commodity electronics, all the way from other supplies all the way to high tech that is then put together and shipped together with the respective know-how and health uh, care related workers that do installations that then do commissioning of new equipment so this entire chain has to be kept intact and uh, we have been working very very hard with the political levels to ensure that the supply chain in the border lockdowns can remain open it was not easy, and that is another lesson learned, that while uh, border lockdowns for, for conventional travel in order to avoid spre spreading the disease might be very important options of early reaction, at the same time, the global supply chain has to be kept intact. And this not just with the purpose of uh, managing and fighting a pandemic, but at the same time, which we believe is as important, is keeping the healthcare systems for, for other diseases that are not impressed by a pandemic like cancer, heart attacks or stroke or, or other communicable diseases to keep these uh, healthcare uh, related services as well intact as at the same time managing a pandemic. So coming specifically uh, to Africa, I mean, uh, we have been very early focusing to really provide solutions once we had developed them very quickly in the test, in the laboratory test world, molecular test world, as well as uh, in the imaging space and treatment space in, to bring these solutions also very, very quickly globally and to Africa. We have uh, uh, followed the respective uh, release options also in collaboration with WHO, which was uh, very supportive. So, and thank you for that partnership and collaboration already at this point. And at the same time, which is always uh, to be recognized, uh, when we speak about Africa, international uh, medtech companies, Draga mentioned it as well. I mean, I also rely to very strong local partner networks and uh, that reaction time was very impressive so that we could bring as quickly as by any means possible the solutions that have been globally made available also very quickly uh, to the African continent uh, within the possibilities of, a cap of capacities we could increase. It was for us 
and this is again a bit of a specificity of medtech important that we can scale our global supply chain uh, with only a very few global uh, supply hubs we have to scale them to the capacity needed we were able in relatively quick time to do this to also serve the need of uh, very package projects where then cts and x-rays and and test portfolio was needed in order to supply in a very balanced way uh, all continents in europe us asia and also on the same priority list africa and we did what we could and i think it uh, and within given constraints it was possible to recognize the needs of africa also uh, reasonably reasonably well so having that said this i think it's important to have an, a look into the future so i mean while obviously this pandemic has put the world into a bit of a phase of shock at the same time it has been a clear wake up call and call for action to a as previous speakers have said uh, be prepared for similar impacts uh, zoonotic uh, diseases might uh, be now more an element of the future more than it was of the past where the last really large pandemic was 100 years behind us we might not have another 100 years until the next one strikes but having said this it is uh, very important now to apply these lessons learned for very quick reaction times by global collaboration global exchange of data and very quick uh, development of test and therapy options and at the same time also of of vaccines in this it is very important to always keep in mind that while a pandemic is extremely important to master and manage conventional diseases conventional in quotation marks non-communicable non-communicable diseases or other communicable diseases will remain so this is why pandemic preparedness has to go hand in hand with building the right concepts for capacities also reserve capacities and there it is very important to keep in mind that at least as it involves medtech which i can speak for is uh, advanced medtech cannot be put in storage it can, you cannot store uh, a couple of hundred x-ray machines or a couple of hundred cts for the case you need it they will be outdated and they will not prevail when for when they are then uh, expected to be put in place so this is why it is very important to think healthcare provision in this holistically for the preparedness but at the same having capacities that can be activated in case needed in order to manage both the additional load on healthcare systems as a pandemic may strike again while ensuring that other uh, pr procedures are treated as importantly i can speak out of experience even from here around that uh, in europe during the first and second waves um, um which happened uh, uh sometime last year in spring uh, spring and summer um we detected through uh, the data we have from our own uh, technologies that uh in this time the uh, related tests for elective procedures like cancer care cardiovascular care did drop significantly and this is why now the discussion is also open that what uh, happened during these days uh, will we see an increased rate of uh, more severe cancers because a couple of months secondary prevention or treatment options were postponed uh, this is definitely an aspect that cannot be part of managing a pandemic that cancer patients or cardiovascular patients have a disadvantage from it um, so healthcare systems have to be prepared to be able to manage both and this is in the context of the long-term future we believe i believe also important for the continent of africa i'm fully aware that africa needs more support and more development of its healthcare systems yet from some of the core elements where europe and and and, and the united states are already take have take are at a different level nevertheless we count on africa as a growing continent with a growing population with growing gdps um, and also with a changing balance between non-communicable and communicable diseases in the next 10 years. So this is why what is the lessons learned 
for the entire planet is for sure also important to reflect and implement uh, in the continent of Africa on its growth and development trajectory we expect in the next uh, 10 to and 20 years. And I close by uh, a clear commitment that uh, Siemens Healthineers, as, uh, as we believe, uh, the largest medtech company based in Europe, and by those means also close to Africa, will do what it's in its capabilities to support the development of the continent of Africa, to do it in close proximity with the global health organizations, with uh, the global trade associations, also with the European Union that uh, has put forth programs in order to support the development of Africa as a, as a continent and very important uh, development area. Because, and I close with how I started, um, it has been very much recognized through this pandemic and also through other examples that healthcare is global and also and healthcare can only be solved globally with local Im implementation, but through global collaboration. And that has to include the key stakeholders of Africa uh, on eye level with everyone else. Thank you very much for having me on this panel. It has been a privilege to be invited. The digital environment makes it possible to connect from all over the world. And thank you for having me. Back to you, Mohammed. Um, Bernard, thank you so much um, for, for your talk today. Um, and I want to also thank all the speakers, our panelists, for very insightful uh, presentations that really have um, brought together this theme of, you know, why we need partnerships for health security. Um, you know, there have been a few questions that came up in the chat, and many of them have been addressed already. Um, but I wanted to give uh, the WHO representative an opportunity to just make some remarks, um, you know, across the presentations we've had today, some observations so that uh, we can use that as a prelude to round up. So Dr. Jonas, please, um, if you give some remarks. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Uh, I, think, uh, I think the most important message I would uh, give to this audience is two things. One is for COVID, we have a proven public health measures, uh, mask wearing, uh, physical distancing, not touching the face, hand hygiene, uh, uh, avoiding crowds and, and so forth. This have proven to be very effective and, and we should try our best as individuals and as a community to transmit that message and practice it so that we can have a better grip uh, on this pandemic. The other is vaccine. Uh, of course, we will, uh, we will increase the range of vaccine quantity as well as uh, uh, the types of vaccine available and ensuring that as many people are vaccinated as early as possible would be another tool. Uh, one thing we have to know is that if we can't prevent more infection through the public health measures or through vaccination, uh, this virus can mutate and can make all the investment in vaccine and other uh, efforts we have done null and void. So uh, to, 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 we have to be, up to now, we have been uh, behind this vaccine uh, until we, we are able to uh, to come ahead of it and stop it, uh, I think uh, the risk is, uh, is high. Uh, and I think all of us from the academia, from the civil societies, from governments, we have to push, we have to push uh, for vaccine equality and we have to push for public health measures to be respected. That way we might be able to to conquer this, um, this, uh, this virus, uh, this pandemic, uh, and also encourage our governments to invest in health, to invest in education, to invest on people so that uh, people can be a force for development 
and could be a fighters of diseases. Uh, I think that's my, my basic message. We are all in it and we have to uh, fight misinformation, fake news, and ensure that our communities are uh, protected. We are all in for it and we can only save ourselves in our collective solidarity and commitment. Over. Thank you. Thank you very much for those wise words. And I want to thank all our panelists uh, today for this session and all those that made time uh, to join uh, Keynote 2. Uh, please continue attending all the other sessions. Um, it's really an excellent meeting that we have organized. Thank you, everybody, and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. All the best.